is the concept that PD-1 and PD-L1 therapies are really the tip of the iceberg in terms of how we can approach um, activating the immune system of cancer patients. But there are many other mechanisms that are immune suppressive in patients. And I think one of the really important things is that when we do our clinical trials, we tend to look at the patients who respond. We don't look at the ones who don't respond. And those are the ones in many ways we should be looking at because they're the ones that have other immune suppressive mechanisms that are preventing um, actually the uh, immune system from, from functioning. So we already have looked at, um, we know, and I really can go through this very quickly, we know that Livo, um, Nivo and Pembro have been very effective, um, and we know the combination therapies, not so much in lung cancer, but have been shown in, um, in, uh, in melanoma, have also been very effective. But the checkpoint inhibitors really only, again, are effective in a certain subset of patients, so there are really other mechanisms that are involved here. So, just to give you an overview of the type of mechanisms, the first thing we talked about, checkpoint blockade, we know that that's a potent immune suppressive mechanism, but cancer cells can also alter their phenotype to evade the immune system. They can also very potently co-opt anti-tumor cells that are normally um, effective against rejecting tumor cells and turn them actually into immune cells that facilitate cancer development. And then the other thing that cancer can do is that they induce either the cells themselves can release immune suppressive molecules that inhibit anti-tumor immunity, or they again induce other host cells in the tumor stroma to release molecules that promote tumor growth. And so if we look just uh, individually at these mechanisms, I'll go through this very quickly because we've already seen the role, and I showed this last night, um, of uh, the role of CD80 binding to CTLA4, an early activation marker of T cells can conduce um, apoptosis, energy, and exhaustion, and will then block uh, T cell proliferation and function. Um, we also know, of course, that PDL1 does the same thing um, to have basically the same effects, but is then a molecule that occurs later in T cell activation. Um, and we also know that PDL1 can reverse signal through CD80, as I mentioned last night. So another mechanism that cells use is that they actually alter, the cancer cell themselves can alter their phenotypes so they become unrecognizable to an immune response. So even if the immune system is able to activate T cells that are potentially reactive against the tumor, the cancer cells are one step ahead and that they've already mutated or changed their molecules so that the uh, activated T cells no longer recognize them. So it's sort of like trying to keep up with the game here that the tumor cell induces, a, presents a tumor antigen of some sort, the immune system responds to that, and then the tumor cell downregulates that molecule. And that can happen through a number of mechanisms. Um, one mechanism is, is that the, uh, uh, the tumor cell will stop producing beta-2 microglobulin, which is really the anchor molecule for the major histocompatibility complex that binds the peptide that's presented to T cells. Um, they can also mutate MHC molecules, either one or several of alleles, or they can be a total loss of heterozygosity. And we can see in all many human cancers, including non-small cell, that there's a range of loss of HLA molecules on the tumor. And if the T cells happen to be active against a molecule that's presented by a specific HLA allele, if that HLA allele is lost, then even if the T cell is activated, it's incapable of actually responding to its target cell. And then the other thing that can happen is, is that the T cell can have its, uh, one of the molecules that's involved in signaling through the T cell receptor, the CD3 zeta chain, can be downregulated, again, by either cells induced by the tumor or by molecules that are produced by the tumor. So in either case, the tumor is really quite clever in either making itself invisible to the immune system or incapacitating the T cell from having the ability to uh, recognize it. And so another prominent phenomenon that happens in, in, in many, if not most, cancer patients is that cancer cells actually take cells that would normally reject the tumor and co-opt them and turn them into immune cells that promote tumor, um, tumor progression. 
And so if we look in, in the ideal situation and what has been noticed in many different types of tumors, but not necessarily all of these in the same tumor type, is that we can have an, a tumor rejecting phenotype where the immune system is working. We can have activated CD4 helper cells that are going to facilitate a CD8 response. We can have macrophages of the so-called M1 like phenotype, which can actually be directly tumoricidal for tumor cells. They can kill them directly or they can facilitate the activation of T cells that, um, that will kill the tumor. Natural killer T cells that are non, um, th that uh, the NKT1 type cells that again can be toxic either directly or through an antibody dependent type of response. And then of course, uh, we can have myeloid cells which can facilitate um, tumor rejection or, or facilitate uh, a tumor regression, as well as um, dendritic cells, which we need to get antigen presentation and activate the T cells. And so what can happen though in the tumor promoting environment under the influence of the tumor cells, that those T helper cells can be converted to T regulatory cells, which are gonna suppress CD8s. The, now I am pushing the right button here. <laughs> The uh, macrophages can be converted to a so-called M2 phenotype. They're going to then produce molecules that actually help tumor growth. Um, the NK1 cells can be converted to NK2 cells, which also facilitate tumor progression. Myeloid progenitor cells can be converted to myeloid-derived myeloid suppressor cells, which are potent suppressor cells that are um, very prevalent in uh, many cancer patients. Um, we and others have shown them in uh, in various lung tumors as well. And the dendritic cells can be converted into defective dendritic cells. Um, we have an expert here in the audience who has worked on that considerably. And this can happen at the expense of a number of other cell types. So if we look at um, some of the immune suppressive molecules that are produced either by tumors or tumors induce the host cells within the tumor to produce, uh, transforming growth factor beta is a very potent molecule. It can inhibit T cell proliferation. It also drives T regulatory cells. Um, indolamine 2,3-dioxygenase, IDO, um, an enzyme that degrades tryptophan, which is required for T cell activation and T cell proliferation. IDO also activates T regulatory cells, and it also induces these myeloid-derived suppressor cells. So IDO is an interesting molecule because it it's produced by many myeloid cells. It's inducible by gamma interferon. So if one has an activated T cell response and an inflammatory signature where you're getting gamma interferon produced within the tumor because you've got activated T cells, you can also cause the upregulation of IDO. So in a way, the activated T cells are inhibiting themselves by producing interferon gamma, which is then going to drive IDO and suppress the activated T cells. Um, we also have IL-10, which is again produced by many tumors. Um, it polarizes immunity towards a type 2 response, which is sort of a collective term for many of the, of the activities that are actually support tumor progression. And then probably less appreciated are um, carbohydrates pre present and expressed again by most, if not, well, by many tumor cells at least, the galactins. Um, and they have a myriad of mechanisms that they use to suppress. They can sequester the TCR, the T cell receptor, um, its ability to co-localize with CD8. So this can reduce actually the ability of the T cell receptor to signal and activate T cells. Um, they also directly induce the apoptosis of, of T cells and it causes the internalization likewise of the T cell receptor. So if we look a little more closely at T regulatory cells, um, these will impede T effector cell function, and there have been a number of um, nice studies showing that in a, a situation where you have poor prognosis, poor prognosis is associated by a high concentration of T regulatory cells in solid tumors, and as you progress towards a better prognosis and effective therapy, you actually um, are getting rid of the, or at least reducing the number of T regulatory cells and your tumor cells are, um, are being killed. Now, Tregs are really multi-talented cells in that they can suppress through really a large variety of mechanisms. Um, we just heard about microRNAs, 
Um, Tregs produce exosomes that contain microRNAs. Um, LET7 is, is one of the ones that's involved, and that's going to actually downregulate and, and cause lack of proliferation and activation of T effector cells. Um, Granzyme B, which is the molecule that T cells actually release to target and kill their target cells, but Tregs will release it and will then um, pass it on to T effector cells and kill the effector cells. T regulatory cells also release IL-10 T effector cells. Many T effector cells have an IL-10 receptor, and that's again going to polarize towards a tumor promoting um, phenotype and downregulate the ability of the CD8 to actually kill the tumor. Um, adenosine, uh, which is also released by T regs, is going to be uh, another. Uh, um, another suppressive molecule that will block T effector cell function and activity, TGF-beta, which we mentioned already, it's immune suppressive, as well as IL-35. IL-35 is an interesting molecule. Um, it's part of the IL-12 family, and IL-12 is a cytokine that normally promotes the activation of type 1 T cells that are going to be anti-tumor. So here we have a molecule that's actually an immune suppressive molecule that has a structure very similar and sequence very similar to a, a, a cytokine that facilitates anti-tumor immunity, whereas IL-35 is actually the opposite and it's a suppressive molecule. Um, and interestingly enough, Tregs again are, are many talented and they, they promote their own growth and um, activity because they auto um, produce TGF-beta and IL-35 and also IL-10 here, um, which is going to support their own ability to be even more suppressive. So as one accumulates more Tregs, one is going to get more, um, more Treg function. Now, of course, um, they, also express, they also express CTLA-4, and CTLA-4 then is the target for ipilimumab. So when one treats with ipilimumab, there's some thought at least that what's actually happening is one's reducing Tregs, and that's what the immunotherapy effect is. Um, let's look at macrophages quickly here. Um, macrophages can, can, there's a spectrum of macrophage function ranging from the so-called M1-like TAMs or tumor, uh, M1 macrophages, which have anti-tumor activity to a pro-tumor effect. There really isn't an absolute breakdown here. It's more of a continuum of cells that have some properties that can promote tumor regression and other properties that promote tumor um, rejection. They're induced by, uh, in this case, by gamma interferon. So when you have those T cells that are infiltrating the tumor and you're an inflammatory signature and you're getting a good immune response, you basically have an M1-like response. Um, whereas when you're in the situation where you have T regulatory cells and you're making IL-10, you're polarized towards an M2 response. They express a number of markers. The markers on the uh, on the left here are associated with um, good antigen presentation and good cytotoxic activity, whereas those on the right are going to promote tumor growth. They also produce a number of cytokines that either support or um, support uh, uh, an immune response or which actually perturb an immune response against TGF beta. Um, and they also produce chemokines, which can chemo attract either pro or anti tumor immune cells into the tumor mi microenvironment. And it seems that macrophages switch from an M1 to an M2 type based on um, their tumor progression in terms of the different phases that are happening in tumor growth. And so the last cell population that I want to talk about are these myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Um, these are cells that were actually originally identified in head and neck cancer patients by Rita Young, and then they were subsequently found in a number of other um, types of tumors as well. Um, they are, again, multi-talented cells. They impede both adaptive immunity because they block CD4 and CD8 T cells, they induce T regulatory cells, and they perturb dendritic cell um, differentiation. And um, they also act on the innate immune system by converting polarizing macrophages from that uh, anti-tumor to pro-tumor phenotype. They also uh, 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 inactivate natural killer cells that have the potential to kill. And finally, they produce a lot of uh, VEGF, so they also promote angiogenesis, tumor invasion, um, and metastasis. 
And I think in lieu of time, I will skip this. This is just really a summary of what I've just said, but um, we'll go through this quickly. And then really the question I think becomes in a clinical sense, where do we go from here and how do we deal with all of these potential mechanisms that can actually suppress the immune system? Um, we know that the immune system has the potential to treat um, and prophylactically prevent cancer, either monotherapies or combination therapies. But I think we really need to understand all of the suppressive mechanisms that are involved in preventing the immune system from acting, and we obviously need to develop therapies for combating those. But I think in terms of therapy, what we need to do is we need to have a way of actually identifying patients, presumably through biomarkers, which suppressive mechanisms are active in patients at which point in their, in their disease and when we want to treat them. And then we need, to, we need to stratify patients in order to figure out what we need to do to deliver the appropriate mechanism to inactivate that suppressive mechanism so the immune system can kick in and, and basically do its thing. So I think that the optimal immunotherapy is really going to be semi-customized for patients once we understand what their immune suppressive mechanism is and what we need to do in order to combat that. Thank you. Hi, Suzanne. Hi, Great talk. Uh, I wondered, uh, you said something intriguing based on the IPI data and depletion of Treg, because I think we need to understand how these molecules are working. It's not always the preclinical data. So clearly, TREMI has activity, uh, particularly in lung and pdl one uh, negative patients, and it's an IgG2, and would there be, in theory, be less able to be an effector or antibody to deplete and might be more of an inhibitory. Could you comment on IPI as an IgG1, TREMI as an IgG2? and whether really that depletion that uh, Alan Corman's group suggested with IPI is really true, if TREMI is just as effective as an IgG2? Well, certainly, I mean, the beautiful work by Jeff Ravitch recently showing that the, the effector and the FC end of the antibody is incredibly important in whether or not an antibody works. Um, and I think his work stands in terms of you can either deplete or you can block, or you can have another effect. I think the other situation, though, with Tregs is, is that Tregs are obviously not present in all patients, and it seems, at least from preclinical work, that the level of Tregs can vary depending on disease state. And so it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all in terms of if you have a patient that has a certain type of disease, um, you're going to use this reagent. You're really going to have to figure out where they are, what stage of disease they're in, and what, uh, whether Tregs are important there or not. Could you then, uh, since you brought that up, uh, comment on the prognostic role of Treg? Uh, it seems that sometimes they're good prognostics, yeah. sometimes they're bad. Yeah, it's a mixed bag. Um, and I think this is sort of, I'm hand-waving here because I really don't know that, but the personal opinion is, is that whether they're not prognostic means that they're clearly not the major immune suppressive mechanism that's active in that patient at that time that therapy is being given. This is for the, thank you, a really beautiful overview. And, um, you know, I think it's very prudent uh, to say that not one size will fit all. And I think that we really have to probably personalize immunotherapy. Um, the one question I have is, um, you talked about really nicely giving an overview of all the different players. The one thing that you didn't mention are CD4 effector cells. Clearly, I mean, everybody talks about CD8, but clearly some immune responses are CD4 driven and nobody talks about it. I was wondering if you would be willing to tackle that. So CD4 effectors? I mean, there clearly are some CD4 cells can be effector cells. I mean, that's been shown very nicely in preclinical and animal model studies. Um, if they express CTLA-4, I actually don't know. You mean, are you asking whether they're going to be targeted by IPI or not? Um, I really don't know. 